And we are privileged to have Tom Clonan, who is one of the military experts, and not only military experts, but one of the defence witnesses for Claire Daly, Mick Wallace and myself. And not only that, but he's also standing for the Senate in the Trinity panel. In the Trinity, is it called Trinity Sector? Trinity panel. In, in the Trinity, Trinity panel, panel, because of the lack of awareness and resources for, in particular, disabled children. Mm -hmm. So, if anyone has any contacts whatsoever in helping him get into the Senate, so even though the purpose of the meeting is to stop the obscenity, and this is what Tom will be talking about, so let's give him a good welcome. Well, for, first of all, thanks very much for inviting me to Galway and having me here as, as your guest. Um, so I'm going to do a couple of things. I'm just going to introduce myself and tell you a little bit about myself so you can um, allow yourself to see how, how, how that informs you as to how credible I am in, in terms of what I have to say or how much of an authority I am on any of the things I'm, I'm going to address this evening. So. After I've introduced myself and told you a little bit about my, my backstory, uh, I'm then going to address three issues. Uh, one would be the, 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 the key developments that have taken place in our uh, defence forces in the last uh, 10 to 15 years. And there has been a significant uh, set of transformations uh, within Oglig Naharan that I think the general public are not, not very aware of. Uh, obviously, you're very engaged. But I think the wider public, and you know, as uh, Margareta was saying to me, I don't think our politicians fully understand uh, some of those developments. Uh, the second thing I'm going to d refer to briefly is about the uh, the dual use uh, trade in in exports, um, which is which is quite interesting, and that's that's a, an area uh, that's developing. And then finally, I just want to comment uh, on the ongoing use of Shannon. Uh, by US forces, especially given the, the plight of refugees in Europe at the moment. Uh, I, I'm, I'm always uh, disheartened when I see my colleagues in journalism talk about initially migrants and then after a few weeks they did eventually reluctantly change the, the, the wording to, to refugees uh, and they can't see a link between those people who are fleeing uh, the Middle East and the 2.2 million US troops that have passed through Shannon Airport. So I just want to talk about those three things. Uh, and I, I hope to be as brief as possible in order to allow uh, as much of a Q&A and a debate. And if you think I'm talking through my hat, please feel free to interrupt and heckle me and whatever you like. Yeah, uh, we don't want that. Okay, <laughs> you're the boss. Well, you, we just, do it anyway. you, you just did it. You just did it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so I'll, I'll start. So, uh, so we're all on a journey. Um, that's something. I'll, I'll be 50 next year. And I'll be 50 on the 100th anniversary of the, the 1916 Rising. And um, obviously, um, I, I'm, I'm now at a stage as a, as a parent and as a kind of a grown-up where I've, I'm beginning to draw certain conclusions <laughs> about how our public discourse runs. Uh, you know, we've all, we're all reflecting after the intellectual and ethical failures of the Celtic Tiger in relation to where Ireland is. And what kind of a country it is, what kind of a society it is. So it's it's a time for reflection, um, and I certainly have have arrived at a set of conclusions that I wouldn't have imagined of. I wouldn't have imagined I would have reached uh, 30 years ago. Uh, so back in the 1980s, um, I, I I graduated from Trinity <clears throat> back in the 1980s, and uh, at that time, like now, we were in an economic crisis. Uh, most of you in the room will remember. Uh, Charlie Hawhey was urging us to uh, tighten our belts. The World Bank was going to foreclose on our national debt. Uh, I did my Leaving Cert in 1984, and of the 90 boys that were in my school in Finglas doing the Leaving Cert that year, by Christmas there were only seven of us left. And actually, funnily enough, uh, I met one of them who's back from Australia, who emigrated 31 years ago, and he says to me, uh, you know, it's the same politicians, Michael Noonan, Rory Quinn, <laughs> that were there 30, 31 years ago. Uh, anyway, so uh, back in the in, when I graduated from Trinity, I joined I joined the Defence Forces, 
Uh, and at that time, uh, what prompted one of the reasons that prompted me to join the Defence Forces was uh, I was having my 21st weekend away, as Jack Eanes tend to do, and I, we're down in Nackal Island. And it was a traditional music session in the pub, and it was interrupted. Uh, the barman said, be, be quiet, be quiet, be quiet. And they put on the TV behind the bar, and we saw the images of two uh, British Army corporals being pulled from a car in West Belfast. They'd driven into a uh, funeral cortege, uh, one of the victims of the, I think it was the Michael Stone killings. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they were pulled from the car and they were stripped and beaten and then executed at the side of the street. And that was all filmed from overhead f- uh, by a British Army helicopter. And I remember at the time, you know, the Berlin Wall was coming down, Europe was opening up, and Ireland seemed to be going backwards economically in security terms. And I suppose as a naive, idealistic young person, I thought, well, if I can join the Defence Forces and if I can save even one life or if I can contribute to a society where you can express a view, uh, give an opinion without having to look over your shoulder and check who it was. And it, I know it's hard for people post ceasefires and post peace process to, to imagine that Ireland. But that was the Ireland that existed in, in the late 80s. And it was quite an oppressive uh, atmosphere. And actually, I think now... And I'll be I'll be speaking in London in January at a debate chaired by Mary McAleese about, you know, the 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 uh, the, the retelling of the troubles that conflict is is not being told in an honest or straightforward way. The British are releasing all sorts of documents. You have loyalist paramilitaries uh, writing plays, screenplays, the same with Republican ex paramilitaries and so on. But we're getting absolutely no information from the on Garda Síochána or my own former organisation, Oblig Nahern, as to how they fought uh, the Troubles. And having been involved in aid to the civil power operations in the late 80s and early 90s, I can tell you it was a dirty war. And there was a lot of collusion, and there was a lot of double dealing. And uh, I think the evidence given at the Smithic Tri- Tribunal of Inquiry into the uh, basically the executions of two senior RUC officers on the border after a visit to Dundalk, Dundalk Garda Station, that is just the tip of the iceberg. And if we are to move forward as a society and continue the peace process and to live the peace process, the least we need to do is to understand our role in that conflict, uh, which which uh, we don't speak about in the Republic. And that age profile of senior guards and people like me who are in the Defence Forces that, at that time, you know, they're beginning to move along. Some of them are uh, shuffling towards the next world. So w- we really only have a limited amount of time to get those people to come on the record and speak. Um, so I joined the, the, the army back in, in the late 80s for those reasons. I was very uh, idealistic and I was completely and utterly immersed in the culture of the Defence Forces. I did everything that a professional soldier is expected to do. Um, I came third, I came sorry sixth in my cadet class out of a cadet class of uh, 42 uh, officer cadets. Um, I served in the artillery corps. I served in on because I had already been to university. I didn't get the opportunity to come here to go to Galway, so I was immediately uh, sent on rotation to to border units. Um, and then in 1995, I went overseas. I went to Lebanon. And in the winter of 1995, spring of 1996, Hezbollah increased its operational tempo in the Irish area of operations. And uh, they began to uh, inflict casualties on the Israeli Defence Forces in a way that had not been seen before. Uh, and the Israelis retaliated uh, very uh, dramatically in, in the months of March and April 1996. And they launched a punitive operation against the people of South Lebanon called Operation Grapes of Wrath. And during that period of time, according to the unit history, and if you look at you can Google it, uh, approximately a quarter of a million Mortars, uh, artillery rounds, um, missiles from helicopter gunships, small arms fire, medium weapon systems were actually fired into the villages and positions that the Irish battalion occupied. And we spent uh, about two months essentially what we call taking the bodies from the wadis or essentially uh, removing the dead uh, from houses that have been struck by missiles or artillery fire. And in South Lebanon, you'd have maybe two or three generations of a family living in, in the one building. And so we uh, essentially would lift, um, with the engineers would dig down into, into the, what remained of the houses and we would take out the bodies of elderly people, children, all ages. Um, and that went on for about uh, two months and it culminated in the massacre of uh, Lebanese civilians at our neighbouring UN position in, in a village called Kwana, where allegedly uh, Jesus turned the water into wine. And uh, 117 
uh, innocent men, women and children were butchered in one incident on that day and the Irish attended that scene uh, and 48 hours later I was walking up Grafton Street with my girlfriend and my dad who was a guard in Dublin, uh, second generation Dublin, was kind of a hard man you know when I began to explain to him what had happened in, in, in South Lebanon during that trip he said to me you know if I were you I'd keep that under your hat because if you keep talking about it people are going to think that you have, you have been uh, affected by it <laughs> as if <laughs> heaven forbid and he said you know it might impact on your uh, you know prospects for promotion um, so the, the massacre of the Lebanese civilians at Kwana uh, was cited in a fatwa by a then relatively unknown Islamist extremist called Osama bin Laden uh, and he actually cites Kwana and that incident that the Irish were at in 1996 as his, his cause for declaring war on the United States and four years later uh, four and a half years later Mohammed Atta and others flew the aircraft into the Twin Towers and the rest as they say is history um, so yeah. when you say the Irish attended that what do you mean? Uh, we, we were first responders on the scene. You were, did you actually witness the scene as it happened, or you came on the uh, Well, we were. It was like two kilometres from our position, so we were, we were all under the same bombardment. But unfortunately for our colleagues, two kilometres down the road, they, they actually suffered a, a number of direct hits. Um, we, um, so when I say we attended it, like we, we were there on the on the day, um, and I, I've written about that in in a, my first book which is called Blood, Sweat and Tears which tells, which tells that story um, but uh, for me the, the, the full impact or the full meaning of that uh, set of experiences only really came home to me um, seven years later in 2003 so I retired from the army in 2000 as a captain uh, for reasons that we don't have time to go in for here today but I basically I did a PhD on women in the military and women in paramilitary organisations and unfortunately my research discovered that there was uh, really high and unacceptably le- high levels of sexual violence against women in the Irish Armed Forces which effectively ended my career led to an independent government inquiry and luckily for me I was vindicated in 2003 when that independent government uh, inquiry called the Study Review Group uh, vindicated my findings and so on but in 2003 um, I had two two children at that point and my third child a uh, baby girl um, died uh, during childbirth so at full term due to a cord accident and at, uh, this was uh, 10 days after my mum had passed away uh, from cancer uh, she was only 67 and uh, when I brought my daughter to the Little Angels plot in Glasnevin Cemetery I had a kind of an epiphany, uh, you know, trying to place her coffin into the ground, a uh, tiny little coffin. I found it really, really hard to turn around and walk away and leave uh, my daughter in the ground. And I suppose it was kind of like a lightning rod f- moment for me in that it connected me in that moment with all of the people that I'd seen in South Lebanon seven years earlier as, as a younger man, uh, but who wasn't an adult, who wasn't a parent. And it's one of those things about military service and about um, the the sort of the mythology of of military service and all of the idealized and mythologized and barrel chested notion about notions about military service and the romanticizing of military service and uh, the military industrial complex as something that has a mission and an overarching set of pro social uh, objectives and at the end of the day as, as you call it here they're they're death industries and what really was the most profound culture shock for me in Lebanon and when I think back on it now and reflect on it is you know the harnessing of all of uh, people's ingenuity and their technological prowess and their education and you know to, to hurt people and to kill people and to kill children and when you kill children and uh, when you kill anybody it's it's the end of the world it it's it is the most uh, anti so it's the most profoundly anti-social act that anybody can engage in and um, so uh, in 2000 then I uh, started my academic career and after the Twin Tower attacks I've been writing for the Irish Times I've been contributing to the Irish Times as the Irish Times security analyst that's how they, they style me and I've, I've always tried to describe conflict in terms that are as, as, as explicit as possible 
And in all of the radio and television interviews that I do with RTE or TD3 or with the BBC or Sky News or CNN or whoever, whomever, I try to be as explicit as I can in order that the, the, the listener might understand uh, precisely what we're talking about. So I don't like to talk about command and control centres. I talk about people. Um, and when I'm describing weapon systems, I try to describe precisely what you know the effect of high explosives is on the ground. You know, the, the blast effect will burn people, the shock effect will, will pulp internal organs and shatter bones, uh, and so on and so forth. And I think uh, for many years, uh, because I was in, engaged in this activity, I think a lot of people thought that I was uh, advocating this. Because when you, sometimes people just confuse description with advocacy. Um, so I'm now, uh, as I said, I'll be 50 next year, uh, and I'm very alarmed at the changes that have taken place uh, in the last 10 or 15 years on, on an international level, which I'll talk about at the end, but on a national level. So I said to you that I would, I would address the changes within the Defence Forces. So I was in the Defence Forces for 12 years. Um, I retired as a captain and the last two years of my military service were as a staff officer for the Chief of Staff. So my, inter- my career trajectory was going up. Um, I think I was appointed as a staff officer to the Chief of Staff, I think, uh, actually about a month before I was promoted captain so that was very unusual for a lieutenant to be uh, appointed into the chief of staff's branch uh, unfortunately for me feminism destroyed my military career in my attempts to conduct an equality audit of the defence forces which effectively my PhD turned turned out to be um, so uh, in, in 1998-2000 uh, the Irish defence forces did one thing for one international agency. They did peacekeeping for the United Nations. But in the noughties, in that period, 2000 to 2010, when we had the big property boom and people were queuing up outside BTs to get their uh, 5,000 euro handbags and so on, a kind of a silent revolution took place within our defence forces. So the defence forces, which is a very, I mean, it's very difficult to describe the internal culture of the Irish Defence Forces. It is a very tightly knit organisation. From the moment you enter, you're you're given to understand that you are the underdog and that you will always be, uh, whether it's overseas or at home, uh, you'll always be uh, confronted by challenges uh, where you'll have superior numbers, superior equipment. And so the the Irish Defence Forces teach you to exploit the maximum from yourself and from those around you. And it's a, it's a very, very secretive organisation by way of international standards. The, unlike the international military, there, there's only an emerging intellectual tradition in the Irish Defence Forces. They don't publish in academic journals. Uh, they're beginning to now, but that's only a development that has taken place in, taken place in the last two or three years. Um, they don't give speeches to um, our members of parliament. They don't, they're, they're not accountable in the same way that the armed forces are in other jurisdictions. Like, for example, in the States, you have the... Um, defense uh, Senate Defense Committee hearings. And you have committee hearings at Congress, where members of the military actually stand up and say things. You won't hear anything here from the military. They're very, very secretive. Uh, and during the 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 noughties, um, the defense forces expanded the range of activities that they engaged in. So not only were they doing peacekeeping, they began to do peace enforcement. And peace enforcement is a euphemism for the full uh, spectrum of combat operations. And not only did they begin to engage in peace enforcement, for example, with the United Nations in uh, East Timor, which would have been one of the first ones in 1999-2000, but they also began to engage in peace enforcement operations um, for NATO-led UN Security Council mandated missions. So, for example, uh, in Kosovo, in the former Yugoslavia, uh, and in in Africa, and they began to mount expeditionary missions to Africa, to Sierra Leone, um, there was peace enforcement in Somalia, uh, and uh, and elsewhere, and more recently, as you'd be aware, in Chad and Central African Republic. So the Defence Forces began to really dramatically expand their role from being peacekeepers for the United Nations to being both peacekeepers and peace enforcers for NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, under the auspices of our membership of the Partnership for Peace Organization, uh, and also for the European Union, 
uh, we're, we're members of we're permanent members of the European battle group system and in fact in the first six months of this year uh, the Irish armed forces were on standby for the Nordic battle group uh, and also for United or, sorry United Nations mandated but EU led expeditionary missions for example to, to Chad and Central African Republic and in more recent years we've had uh, up until very recently we've had troops in Uganda Irish troops in Uganda training uh, militias to fight against uh, Islamists in in uh, in Somalia and elsewhere. We've had uh, Irish troops serving alongside British troops in Mali, again to train militias uh, to combat uh, Salafist and Wahhabi elements that are uh, moving, you know, towards places like Timbuktu uh, in Mali. And and the French were involved in pushing them back. I think it was last year. Before, so you know, really, uh, the range of deployments that the Irish uh, military engaged in are, are very, are very varied, uh, and and very interesting, but not for the right reasons. I would say yes. Who's paying for it? Well, the Irish taxpayer. Really? Yeah, I mean, for the most part. Now, the, the United Nations does commit to refund or reimburse uh, the you know contributing nation states. Uh, and for me, the most surprising one of all is uh, we have had troops in Afghanistan uh, since 2002. And uh, I'll just very briefly explain the, the role of the Irish, uh, the, the, the very special and particular role of Irish troops in Afghanistan. We've had uh, Irish troops in Afghanistan since 2002 as a participating and contributing nation to um, Operation Enduring Freedom, which is... a uh, basically for the most part a US led operation in Afghanistan of which you're, you're all aware and um, the United States were very keen for Ireland to become participants in that obviously the more uh, members of, of the coalition of the willing they have the greater legitimacy it gives their their activities there but also the Irish had a very particular set of experiences in relation to improvised explosive devices so to, to, to make it really simple uh, during Vietnam uh, two thirds of all U.S. combat casualties were to small arms fire, so they'd be on a patrol in, in a jungle or in a village, and they'd be attacked by the North Vietnamese Army or the Viet Cong, and they would have a firefight, and their troops would be injured by small arms fire. But if you go through to the global war on terror, so-called, uh, approximately two thirds of U.S. Ca- and British casualties would be to roadside bombs, not small arms fire, roadside bombs or improvised explosive devices. So it became what the British would have referred to in the 1920s in Ireland as a ditch war. And the Irish had an expertise in this because we've been dealing with the provisional IRA and other dissident Republican groups for 30, 40 years now. And they would be very, very sophisticated bomb makers. We also had a very long uh, period of experience in South Lebanon dealing with the type of improvised explosive devices that would have been placed there by Hezbollah, which would have been possibly Iranian backed or Iranian designed to be an Iranian signature on, on some of those devices and, and bomb making techniques and also we had been exposed for many years and still are to Israeli improvised explosive devices which are also very very sophisticated so the Irish had this reservoir of skills and expertise which the Americans thought would be very useful in their attempts to reduce the number of casualties uh, that they were sustaining through improvised explosive devices so the Irish government and I've heard the Defence Forces press office downplay uh, the role of Irish troops in Afghanistan, but they played a very, very important role there, and one for which the United States were very, very grateful. Now, how that sits with our neutrality, I don't know. I don't know how you can participate in Operation Enduring Freedom uh, and to be on the NATO uh, ISAF website as a contributing nation and at the same time Claim, claim to be neutral. So there's some of the, the changes that have taken place within the Defence Forces and, and the white paper on defence um, kind of consolidates those changes and contains within it a prescription for the development of our, uh, our capabilities out to 2025 and beyond that, that will continue and copper fasten and uh, if you like really um, propel and accelerate um, those type of, of developments. So the Defence Forces has, is, is taking a direction that um, I don't, don't think any of us would have anticipated. And if you look at the history of the Defence Forces, it has always responded to external uh, forces. So in the 1930s and 40s, 
the Irish uh, Defence Forces expanded because of the emergency, the euphemism for World War Two, and then it contracted again in the in the fifties, and then expanded in the in the sixties and seventies as a response to the the threat posed by the Troubles. It went through a period of shrinkage in the in the in the nineties, and now we're into a period of change, which is prompted by the international security environment. And I don't know if it is in our interests, but it certainly fits with the kind of uh, the design for foreign policy, which contains within it a huge emphasis on force and preemptive force uh, as an imperative. Uh, the, 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 the direction and the pace and the rate of development within our armed forces seems to fit that more than any internal threat that, that, that I can see here. Um, um, who's making that decision then? Well, that's, that's a decision that is made by under the triple lock. So under the triple lock, if the, the Irish government requires that there's a U- UN Security Council mandate and then that there is Doyle and uh, government approval. So basically any government that has a majority um, just agrees to send troops. Like, for example, Alan Shatter um, decided that it would be useful, uh, along with his cabinet colleagues, it would be useful if Irish troops went to Golan and, and Syria after the Austrians withdrew, and that's why we have troops in Syria at the moment. So it's just a decision made at government level. There's no uh, kind of public input, I mean, aside from, you know, it's like a lot of government policy decisions. But, but under the Defence Act, they, they keep it below 12, so it Well, for, cer- it. for certain missions, <coughs> for, the, yeah. for the one in um, Afghanistan, the numbers have always been below 12. But I mean... But that's far- deliberate, isn't it? It is, yeah. It's to mask uh, their involvement there and to avoid uh, the, be the be requirement for a debate in yeah. Parliament. Um, so we, we, I, I'll take questions on that at the end, but I just wanted to move on then to um, the, the, the dual use or military exports yeah. to, to, uh, uh, to foreign powers. So th- there has been a recognition since 2008 uh, that there is a requirement for more regulation and control of the export of, of weapons and weapon systems and technology that can be weaponized. Um, you know, with the collapse of this, the, Soviet, the former Soviet Union and the New World Order, a lot of old Warsaw Pact armament found its way into the wider uh, public domain. And, you know, everybody from criminal gangs to uh, subversive groups around the world were suddenly found uh, they had access to, you know, AK 47s. Pistols, plastic explosives, uh, mortars, medium weapon systems, uh, and and that's a trend that has continued. But there has been a wider sort of liberalisation of of the arms trade, and you know with drone technology. And I'm 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 alarmed to see that Ireland is being promoted as a kind of a place where drone technology can be tested. And you know the the uses to which drones can be put. It, it, the, these are this, drones are the seeds uh, of our own destruction, really, because it takes the moral component and the, deci- the human decision-making component out of uh, the decision to kill, and they really are uh, robots for killing. And I know that sounds very tabloid and it sounds very uh, Star Trek and science fiction, but that is actually the case. And the yeah, prolific. Someone has to press the button. Man. Yeah, but uh, I don't want to bore you now, but they've developed new technology that. Yeah, you know, the, the guys and girls who fly the drones um, from US air, air bases in, in the United States, they go into these air conditioned kind of porta cabins and they fly drones that are operating in Afghanistan. But they put little hair nets on them and they've discovered through testing that um, if you show somebody a, a satellite image and then put down 400 satellite images on the ground and you ask the conscious mind to identify the pre- this precise scienti- uh, satellite image that you've been shown, it might take you three quarters of an hour to find it. Whereas if you put this hairnet on, the subconscious mind recognises it immediately in a flash. So they are now developing systems whereby the the firing mechanism, and I've written about this in the Irish Times, the, the firing mechanism will be will be controlled by the subconscious mind. And that takes, you know, the, all of the ethical considerations. But aside from that, everybody in this room knows, uh, especially as, as Irish people, you know, when we saw the, the aircraft fly into the Twin Towers, there was a huge emphasis in the United States on how did this happen? How could this happen? 
But uh, I think a lot of people here would say, well, why did this happen? You know, who would be so motivated to, to, to commit such an appalling act? And if you think of the proliferation of drones, you know, wh- what will that... It's not how can the drones uh, continue their, their development. It's what will the consequences be? And I think, you know, it'll, it'll be... The, the consequences will be horrific. Uh, and, you know, we, we can't even begin to calibrate what that will lead to. Uh, you know, just the, the level of disinhibition. Um in relation to the use of force. Um, so in Ireland, we're, we're a part of that uh, big international industry. Um, and since 2008, when it was decided in the Department of Jobs, Enterprise and Innovation that technology, IT equipment, any sort of products that, that can have a dual military use, they need to be licensed for export. So the number of licenses has, it has, has gone up and down uh, since 2008, but broadly speaking, since 2008, the number of licences that are being issued by Minister Bruton's department it has pretty much doubled. And we now export uh, products that have a military use to the tune of a, a, a approximately 749 million per annum. It's almost a billion. It's just, you know, it's three quarters of a billion in exports from Ireland. And uh, all over the world, uh, approximately one tenth of that goes to Israel. And again, we're all conscious of, of, of the ways in which uh, Israel uses its, uh, its military technology. But again, for me as, as a parent and a, as, as a grown-up and as somebody who's, who's seen at first hand what this stuff does, uh, I don't think it's an industry that we should be involved in. I mean, irrespective of the numbers involved, because it's so hard to have a discussion in Ireland without the horrible language of you know, the quantitative language of economics and business cases and bottom line and export import and wealth creation and and the law moral legalism this is about ethics we should we should not be involved in that business we should not be involved in that trade or industry it's it's as you say here Margaret, it's it's a, it's a death industry and and we are um you know becoming more and more integrated into that so in the same way that our military it's become more and more integrated into international military structures. I think our, uh, the imperative or the modus operandi of our, of our technology engineering industry is becoming more integrated into the, 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 the wider military industrial complex. And Shannon? Uh, so finally then, yeah, on Shannon, look, uh, when, when I started writing for the Irish Times, uh, I've had the opportunity in the last 15 years to travel. Uh, in my capacity, not as a soldier, but a, as a journalist. And I've been to Guantanamo Bay, and uh, I actually was the first journalist to get on the record in the Irish Times, the first journalist anywhere in the world to get on the record that they were force-feeding uh, the prisoners. They like to use the word detainees, but the prisoners in Guantanamo Bay were being force-fed by a US Navy surgeon who actually took off his name tag because we had an argument in the sick bay about it, and he said... Um, that they were on a, it was a, a continuous fast. And I said, well, we call that a hunger strike in Ireland. And he said, oh, you know, you Irish guys, you know, yeah, well, I suppose you would call it a hunger strike. And the handlers began to step in. No, we, we don't use that term. But So he said, no, no, it is, it's a hunger strike. And he explained to me how they inserted the nasal tubes and force fed. Now, that's a matter for the public record now. But uh, I was the first person to get that on the record from the Americans. And I also got on the record from the... Americans that they were that they fully intended to execute prisoners in Guantanamo Bay and how that came about we were looking at uh, Camp Echo which is their state of the art facility and uh, it's a push button facility modeled on a, a correctional fi- facility in the United States and as they were touring me around it they opened up one room and it was um, kind of tiled on the floor and up the walls uh, I think the ceiling was even tiled and there was a, a trolley in the middle uh, with a stainless steel bed and a kind of a drain in it. It looked to me like the type of place where you'd carry out a post-mortem. Mm. And I said, what's this? And again, the handler said, well, but the spokesperson for the US military was very voluble. And he said, well, uh, he said, this isn't Nuremberg. We can't hang the prisoners. And I thought, well, that's good to hear. And he said, because the US uh, public consider hanging to be a cruel and unusual punishment. And he said, and we can't shoot them because at this point the handlers were getting a bit uncomfortable. He said, we can't shoot them because, believe it or not, he said, some of our sailors and marines here, the young men and women, 
uh, actually develop a relationship with the with the with the detainees as they call them. So if we shot them, it would be bad for morale. So he said, when it comes to execution, we'll do it. And he pointed to the the uh, the uh, the trolley or the gurney, as they call it. He said, we'll do it like we do it in the state side. We'll do it by lethal injection. And um, so one of the things that struck me when I was in Guantanamo Bay. Uh, and I signed an agreement not to describe certain parts of Guantanamo Bay, um, but the airport contains uh, contained at that time, back in 2005, a lot of aircraft that I'd seen in Shannon, uh, same aircraft types. Um, and uh, so that, that struck me as being interesting. Now, again, this linkage that Ireland has with the, with the global war on terror. Uh, I've also been, been to Syria, and, and the last time I was in Syria, the Syrians flew me out to... Uh, I was there as part of a European Union delegation um, and we were guests of the Assad regime at the time just as the internal conflict was beginning to kick, kick off and I was taken out to the border with Iraq out to Al Anbar province to a checkpoint called or a border crossing called Al Walid Al Tanf and there were one million Iraqi refugees there under plastic bags essentially plastic sheeting and it was an absolutely... I mean, I can't even begin to describe the scene to you. It was just ho a hopeless scene. And the Syrians that brought me to the border crossing said, we can't, we can't control this. This is going to de internally destabilise um, Syria. And again, the, the rest is history. And a lot of the people that we dealt with during that brief period, including the foreign minister, are now uh, indicted for, for, for war crimes. Um, so... For me, having seen it firsthand, the, the troops that come through Shannon, and this is what I was trying to explain in, in court in Ennis, like the guards, to me, a lot of those guards, they look like family people, family-oriented people. If they knew, if they could see what happens when the US troops who pass through Shannon, the, the net effect of their actions, if they could see, I don't think, that, I don't think they would tolerate it. I don't think they'd put up with it. I think they would intervene. So, I mean, I would have thought for a very long time that Mick Wallace and Claire Daly were crazy. But they're right. They're absolutely right. And there are weapons in those aircraft. And again, I was able to play a recording in court, you know, where, you know, the, the cabin crew on, on the aircraft, these are the civilian aircraft carrying US troops to Shannon, say, you, we're now landed at Shannon Airport, you have an hour, I won't read out the full quote, it says, please, you know, place your weapons on the floor of the aircraft and automatic pistols can go in the overhead bins. Please do not bring weapons into the duty-free area where you have your pint of Guinness. Um, so we have to ask ourselves as Irish citizens, um, after 2.25 million US troops have gone through Shannon, the largest invading army ever to pass through this island in its history, is the world a safer place for those troops having passed through our airport? I don't think so. Um, we now have uh, 4 million Syrian refugees on the road and, and you see them in the fields of Slovenia in Serbia you know, trying to get to Germany 190,000 arriving so it, it has completely destabilised the, and we, we can't, the, the Middle East now I know that there, and, you know, there's a Sunni versus Shia uh, issue in play in the Middle East with Iran on the one, one end of the spectrum and the Gulf states on the other but we are directly connected to that uh, conflict. We can't. It's ha it's happening in a field in Shannon. We can't. We can't. So we can't say, "Oh, we're Irish. We're neutral. It's nothing to do with us." And then you know, look at the body of little uh, Ilan Kurdi on the beach at Kos and say it's nothing to do with us. We have facilitated the the, the conditions that have forced uh, directly and indirectly, you know, millions of people to flee. You know. We're, our, our name is on that and in 2006 I didn't know and when, when we played this in court it wasn't reported mm. by my mm. colleagues and I'm sorry to say this on the record but there is no interest uh, for me as a security analyst certain stories don't fly they don't want to know they don't want to hear it this is a sort of a it's, it's seen as unseemly to criticise uh, the role of Shannon in the, this huge crisis that's unfolding around us now. And that's, that's an issue uh, that 
I think will will come to haunt us at some point. Anyway, uh, in terms of you know the, the sheer money involved, you know we went through this in court. Twenty five million paid to the Department of Transport for overhead flights because the air navigation costs are paid for by the Irish taxpayer. So that works out at about six thousand euro per day. I have a little fellow who's in a wheelchair who can't get. He's actually in a wheelchair that's too small for him because of austerity and cuts. He can't get physiotherapy and he can't get speech therapy, occupational therapy, uh, hydrotherapy or surgical review. You know, and we're paying six thousand euro per day for the onward navigation fees of U.S. military aircraft passing overhead at thirty-three thousand feet. Forget about what you see on the ground at Shannon. We've paid twenty-five million for the onward navigation of military aircraft and where are they going you know they're going to the horn of africa they're going to iraq afghanistan you know since barack obama decided to get involved with isis uh five and a half thousand airstrikes what has that achieved islamic state now hold greater territory than they held before and actually at al walid al tanf border crossing where i was a couple of years back that's now controlled by islamic state anyway uh so really what I, I just wanted to come here and say to you was, uh, I am a retired army officer. I, I should be the most conservative person in the room. Uh, but I'm absolutely, uh, I'm very alarmed and very disturbed at the direction and trend in, in which we are we're going. And, and all the more so because with the exception of people like yourselves, there is no debate. I, it's been a long time since I sat in a radio studio and you know, had it out with somebody like Richard Boyd Barrett or, uh, or Mick Wallace or Claire Daly. You know, just, we, we don't have that conversation here. We're not informed. Well, we're and, having it now. Yeah, and I think, it's, I think what you're doing is, is very important. And in rooms like this, I know, yeah. I'm sure the parents of Island Cardi and others would thank you for what you do. Anyway. <laughs>